Good morning and welcome to First Memorial. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please join me in the welcome and opening words printed in your bulletins. Once again, we gather to worship the author and finisher of our faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it is written, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Happy are those who know their help is in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Please join me in our two opening songs of praise, O Church Arise and Lord I Need You. The lyrics are printed in your bulletins. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand An army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nature. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Arise, shine, for the risen sun. Lift your eyes, we are his radiant bride. Arise. cross where love and mercy meet as the son of God is stricken then see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and Christ emerges from his grave this victory march Continues till the day every eye and heart we shall see him. So, Spirit, come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of His grace. We hear the calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory. Oh uh -huh. 
to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I fall on you Jesus you're Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sins that grace might bridge and we might cross the great chasm that appears between us. With open hearts, let us pray. Dressed in fine linen, we feast sumptuously every day while others long to satisfy their hunger. We have Moses and the prophets Yet we remain unconvinced, waiting for some human warning. Forgive us. In your mercy, convince and comfort us and lead us to righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Through Christ, we are carried away by the angels, comforted by Father Abraham, 
our hunger satisfied, our agony cooled, and our sins forgiven. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. While we are standing, let us join our voices in professing our historic Christian faith with the modern translation of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the Beatitudes, Jesus reminded us that blessed are the peacemakers, and he is still calling us to be peacemakers. For our world needs gestures of Christ's peace as much or more than ever. Passing the peace is rooted in the Hebrew word shalom, which refers to peace with God as well as the peace of God. So as Jesus said shalom when he met with friends, I say to you, the peace of Christ be with you. Please share a warm greeting and a sincere sign of God's peace with those here without leaving your seat and with anyone you call or meet this week. All right, good morning, guys. How are you? Good. I'm glad. How many of you guys wake up to an alarm clock when you go to school? Uh, yeah. yeah, you do? You have an alarm clock? Your alarm clock might be your mom and dad, right? Do they wake you up? No? no? You actually have an alarm clock that makes a loud noise? No. Oh, it's a music one. Oh, on Alexa. Oh, that Alexa. She could do so much stuff, right? Yeah. All right. So, but on Alexa, can you hit snooze? Can you hit a snooze button on Alexa? Do you know what a snooze button does? What does it do, Serenity? You, you get probably about 10 more minutes. On my snooze, it's nine, which is really weird. But you get nine more minutes of sleeping right before you hit it again and then you get nine more minutes of sleeping right so what happens if you keep doing it over and over and over and over again what do you think might happen you won't get up and what do you think do you think you'll be late for school probably yeah and do you think maybe you get so used to hearing the beeping or the music that maybe you just sleep right through it? So if it comes back on again, you just don't even wake up? That could be a problem, right? It only, it only, do it once. It only does it once for you? Oh, I do it a lot of times. So, do you know, yeah, especially as early as I wake up, I hit it as many times as I can. So, do you know sometimes God acts as like that alarm clock, and he tries to send you a wake-up call, right? Yeah. 
Do you think that it's a big, loud, beeping sound? No, it's not. It's probably something that you're feeling. You're going to feel it in your heart or in your gut. We call it like, oh, that's a gut instinct. It, that's God talking to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. But do you think that you should hit snooze if God is talking to you? Yeah. No, 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 right? So <laughs> you say, God, please, one more minute. <laughs> All right. Well, do you know that some people do hit the snooze button when God is trying to talk to them? And sometimes they hit it so many times that, like the alarm, they just don't hear him anymore. And that's kind of what happens in our scripture lesson that I'm going to read as soon as I'm done with you here. So there was a rich man, and then there was a beggar that lived outside, and his name was Lazarus. And every day, the, that's his name. And so the rich man would walk past him, and Lazarus would ask him for some food or something. And the rich man ignored him so many times that he just didn't even hear him anymore when Lazarus would ask. So... They both passed away, right? They both died. And, okay, oh, Abby, Abby. So then, do you think that the rich man went to heaven? He, igno yeah. Do you think Lazarus went to heaven? Yeah. So, so the rich man was down in hell, and he said, he talked, he was talking to Abraham, and he says, oh, can you just have Lazarus give me one drip of water? It's so hot down here. And you know what Abraham said? No. And he said, because of what you did to Lazarus, this is what happens. And so then he asked, the rich man asked Lazarus, well, can you send Lazarus back down to earth so that I can warn my brothers? So that he can warn my brothers that, hey, you guys need to act better so that you don't end up down here like me. And you know what Abraham said? No. So. The rich man, he hit snooze too many times on, on Lazarus and on God, and it was too late for him. So do you, want, do you think that we should hit snooze on God? No, right? No. We want to listen to God, and we want to do what he says, right, so that we all end up in heaven too. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for talking to us. And we know that we should not hit snooze if we get that gut feeling that you're trying to tell us something. Amen. Today's lesson is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. For maximum, maximum understanding, please follow along in your own Bible or in the translation in your bulletin which follows. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to, to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he, had, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed 
so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to, to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but this but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you see what God sees? Do you? We're looking especially at Luke 16, 25 today. Jesus in his teaching to the Pharisees says, But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Anybody get a little bone chilling with that statement? Remember that during your lifetime you received your good things. Lazarus, not so. But now he is comforted here. And you, you went to that other place. We come to today's lesson after Luke has already relayed conversations Jesus had with Pharisees over the faithful stewardship of goods and resources, which we can summarize very generally as wealth, as long as you don't think it's only money. Jesus has been challenged by and answering Pharisees about this business of money and generosity and the stewardship of wealth. Because Jesus sees these issues as issues of justice, of what's right and what's wrong. The Pharisees are just argumentative. You know, when you're having a, a conversation with somebody who doesn't agree with you on something, no matter what you say, about your position, they don't hear you because they are thinking about how to answer you and win you over to their position. It's hard to have a conversation when there is no meeting of the minds. It's hard to have a conversation when you can't see the other person's position, the other person's value the other person's reason for thinking differently than you do. Do you see what God sees? Seeing things differently is no less common today than it was when Jesus was going at it with the Pharisees. The issues which divide us today seem more numerous now than in the simpler biblical times, and they affect more people, or at least a greater percentage of the general population, where this conversation that Luke is talking about to us today is basically just between Jesus and the pillars of the church. Hmm. A 
Opposing points of view. We sure have more than our share of them now, don't we? Just about any subject. Economic justice is an issue for God. It's a value for God. It is important to God because people are important to God. The rich man is important to God in the story, but so is Lazarus. But the rich man does not see what God sees. I mean, Lazarus sits at the gate to the man's house. He's out there at the street. He wouldn't trespass. Today, in zip code 90210, all those gates are motorized and they swing open to allow Teslas and Escalades and other things that cost more than $100,000 to get you from point A to point B. And if you can afford those, fine. God is not against you having nice things. But God expects you to see what he sees. And he sees neglect. He sees a difference between the haves and the have-nots. And it's basically their view of the world. Their view of what is important. Their sense, my least favorite word in the English language today, I've told you before. Entitlement. Whether it's the parking space somebody's trying to beat you into, or the slot in the traffic line. The other day, somebody came right up on my bumper and stayed there so I couldn't see his bumper or license plate. So I slowed down, because I'm not very Christ-like when it comes to driving. So he zipped around me and then pulled in front of me and slowed down to take the exit ramp that was right there. But he had to beat me to it. I'm not the only one who grinds my teeth when that happens. I'm not naming names. I've seen how some of you drive. But that's not what this is about. Make no mistake about it. In this parable, the haves are represented by the rich man. I mean, he's described right at the outset of the scripture lesson. He's got purple clothes. That's practically royalty. It certainly ain't cheap. Didn't get it at the dollar store. Nor did they get it at Walmart. Right? The rich man's got it. The symbolic things describing having it are all there in that introductory couple of sentences. And the have-nots, there's nothing to describe about Lazarus except the fact that he couldn't even stand at the gate. He was on the ground, didn't have his bottle of Poland spring water, didn't have his sandwich in his igloo cooler, didn't have nothing. So much so that he would settle for the scraps the crumbs, if you will, off the rich man's table. And although the scripture says that, it doesn't say he ever got the crumbs off the rich man's table. But he would have been satisfied. He would have been satisfied with anything because the point is he was hungry. And while he sits there, so that the rich man has to walk very close to get around him, to get into his gate, to get into his house, to sit down at his table, and to have his prime rib or his lobster, both of which I'm very fond, by the way.
Today I think it's going to be from the sea. But Lazarus got nothing. He didn't even get attention from the rich man. He didn't even get noticed. Of course, you have to wonder if Lazarus' leg happened to be stretched out a little too far so that the rich man had to walk a little farther to get around him, he might have got one of those looks. You know, the look that we give people that are in our way. Even though the rich man had to pass Lazarus to get to his front door, You all know Yiddish, right? Marcus. That's what Lazarus got from the rich man. Marcus. Call it a focus thing, call it a perspective thing, but their vision in the philosophical sense are radically different, Jesus and the Pharisees. Pharisees were very interested in righteous people like us. And wealth was involved to some degree in the how the Pharisees looked at the rest of the population. So much so that the symbolic rich man, after he's dead, goes to that other place that we don't like to name. Both parties are dead. But the rich man suffers. The rich man's air conditioning doesn't work. And his refrigerator has no Poland spring in it. Doesn't have anything. And so here he is suffering thirsty, probably hungry, and he happens to look up, and now he sees Lazarus, who's got something he doesn't have, and included in that by no mistake or casual reason, Lazarus has a name. In this story that Luke is quoting from Jesus, the rich man doesn't even get a name. He's that important. Not. But Lazarus, who had nothing in life, had a name. How do you feel when somebody, like the pastor who has no short-term memory, doesn't remember your name, doesn't call you by your name, Please don't test me at the door. If I don't hear people call you by your name, I don't hear it enough to remember it. Mea culpa. But for a different reason, the rich man doesn't say Lazarus' name until he wants something from Father Abraham. And what he says to Father Abraham, you know, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. A good friend of mine who's a retired Christian edu education director and I were talking about this sermon last night on the phone, and she said, you're going to sing that song, right? I said, no, I don't get to choose the praise songs. That belongs to somebody smarter than I who specializes in that field. Father Abraham, did you know that song? Has many sons, you taught Bible school. Many sons has Father Abraham and I am one of them. Whoop, that's politically incorrect. And so are you, doesn't apply to everybody in the room, does it? And all we do is praise the Lord. Well, that's the part I have a problem with, which is why I wasn't gonna sing the song. But I know Linda is watching this. And so, ha ha, I did it anyway. 
Father Abraham is the father is the Abraham of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is considered the father of the nation of Israel. God's chosen people, not the chosen frozen, that's us. God's chosen people. So anybody who considers himself to be our creator's children sees Father Abraham as theirs, who makes us special by our association with recognizing him as the father of God's people, all God's people. So the rich, nameless rich man (laughs) calls to Father Abraham and says, hey, I'm down here suffering. And for the first time, says his name, Lazarus is sitting up there next to you. I'm dying here. Well, that's kind of an overstatement. Send Lazarus down here with his fingers dipped in water so that I can have a couple of drops on my parched tongue. And all of you should be going, oh, poor rich man. Even after the differentiation between a neglectful rich man and a lifelong suffering poor man is now clear to the point where he's asking for help. He's referring to Lazarus like he's some kind of servant or slave. He still doesn't rank being a person of value, a person worthy of the rich man's attention, much less generosity. He's not looking to give Lazarus anything. He just wants to take from Lazarus. Albeit a few drops of water from his fingertips on his parched tongue. Oh, poor rich man. The rich man still doesn't see Lazarus as a concern or a responsibility of his. He doesn't see him as a neighbor, much less a neighbor in need. And he has to walk past him to get to his front door. Man, he's... You know, we, we are supposed to see this dramatically just opposed. So that it's so obvious... To a point. But do you see yourself as a rich person? Well, all of us, when we read this passage, look left and right. And for some of us, we tend to dwell on the fact that to our right, people have a bigger house, finer car, better job, nicer clothes, better vacations, and on and on it goes. While people on the left, that left and right is not political, it's just directional. People on the left, they're seeing people that have even less than they do. Because Jesus' issue about economic justice is that everybody has something to give somebody when they have less than you do. Everybody has something to give. Sometimes it's compassion. Sometimes it's attention. Sometimes it's friendship. Sometimes it's help with something that is broken and you can't fix, but this person who has the know-how and the tools and can drive to Home Depot blindfolded can take care of it for them. My sister lives in a pretty upscale neighborhood And there are a lot of seniors there, you know, chronologically gifted. And it it delights me, after a snowstorm, to see the number of young neighbors, Tesla drivers probably, 
who get out their snowblowers and go down the street and take care of the driveway and sidewalk of the person who doesn't have the health or the strength or the equipment to do that for themselves. And by the way, in this neighborhood, the kids do not go out and knock on your door and say, can I shovel your walk for 10 bucks or 20 or 50 or 100? They don't come out and knock on your door. Do they? It's not the way we grew up. <laughs> I had a guy I grew very fond of at the Dunville Church who was a farmer's son. He had seven brothers and sisters. There was a great big picture in his dining room, huge blown up photograph of all eight kids, each one wearing a military uniform of one variety or another, was taken when they were all home for Christmas from World War II one day. And he loved to tell stories, and I loved to hear about Old Time Denville, which was then Old Time Rockaway. Well, not World War II, that was, it was Denville then. But the point I'm trying to get to, stay on track, Alan, is the fact that he tells the story of, because we were talking about school, they had a long walk to get to the local school for them. If they, when they were in high school, they had to walk to Dover to get to high school. He said, well, you know, snow wasn't all that much fun because if it snowed and school was closed, we had to go out and shovel the rural two-lane unpaved road to the nearest intersection, which was a couple of football fields away. Can you imagine? A kid doing that today. And dad didn't give him any money. But all eight of them were out there. There were eight shovels in the barn, hanging on the wall by the door. And if it snowed, they did that for their benefit and well-being and for the neighbors who needed to get to get food or get to the doctor or whatever. It was a selfless thing to do. Young and strong. And off to war, all eight of them went. The girls and the boys. Taking care of others. Being responsible for other people's needs. To do things for them they can't do for themselves. Compassion. Companionship, wisdom, know-how, and don't leave out financial. When I was in seminary, the first year, after a few months, the battery in my old car, which was what my car was in those days, <laughs> went dead. Dead as a doornail. On Highway 20, busy road. And I needed to get it replaced. So I did. Because I needed the car to get to work downtown at Sears, where I sold shoes, which is why my CB nickname was Soul Saver. Hey, I didn't make it up. <laughs> Just telling you what people called me. And I also needed my car to get to a church that wasn't right next door to the seminary where I was paid as a seminarian to run their youth program. Cush job. But I still had to get there. So the car was not exactly a luxury. So, what did I do? I had the car brought to Sears and with my Sears paycheck and my Sears employee discount, I got me a diehard. And the car ran like a top after that. So I got home and somebody said, so how did your day go? I said, well, 
my car battery died, but I got a new one, and everything's fine. That night, when I came back from my evening class, there was an envelope taped to my bedroom door anonymously. It had my name on it, but nobody else's, and there was nothing inside but cash. I'm pretty sure it wasn't from a faculty member because I didn't tell anybody on the faculty that I had my battery die on Route 20. And I had a job. And I had the money to get a new battery. And here is this envelope, anonymous, no identifying marks whatsoever, with two or three dollars more than I actually needed. And I just stood there and looked at it and I immediately felt guilty. Because I could take care of it myself. I didn't need this help. And I said that to a friend of mine later in the evening. You know, I don't know what to do. I had this envelope with this money. I've already paid for the battery. I had the money in the bank. I have two jobs. I may have been also working in the kitchen at the seminary, which meant I actually had three jobs, but I needed a car to go there. Hard working Protestant. And my friend said to me, has it occurred to you that maybe God needed you to know that your need mattered to him and to his. That is to say that your need, which you didn't perceive as being that great because you could take care of it yourself, your need mattered to him enough for him to motivate one of his own to cough up the money and put it in the envelope just to prove to you that you matter that you're noticed, that God sees you, and when God points one of his people to see your need, they respond. My friends, without my classmates' help, I never would have figured that out. But I can promise you, I will never forget that lesson. And I have bought batteries for people and coats for people. Somebody paid it forward. It's not about being paid forward. It's about caring about God's values, about economic justice, so that everybody has what they need. If it's within my ability. If it's within my God-given resources. Do you see what God sees? Or do you walk around or look away or not even recognize the existence of people and take the time to know their name? The other day I was at ShopRite and there was, I would assume, a high school student and he was standing there at the register in between customers because this lady was in front of me was taking a long time to pack her bags and I couldn't move up, rubbing his shoulder and wincing. And I said, are you uh, an athlete in school? I mean, are you the, did you get a sore shoulder from throwing too many touchdown passes or something? And he goes, no, I hurt all over. And I made some comment. And then the lady schoolgirl checker in the next line said to him, well, you're getting attention, aren't you? But the boy, amidst his pain, smiled. I couldn't help but see he was suffering. Now this is not a, ain't Alan wonderful? because I'm not. But I do notice people. 
I don't notice everybody, but I like to think that when God points me in somebody's direction, I see them. And I see their need. And sometimes it costs me money, and sometimes it costs me time, and sometimes it just costs a little attention. But I'm a rich man. I am blessed to have what I have. And we all ought to be aware that we have something to give when God draws our attention to it. But if we are so practiced and so programmed and so doing it such a long time that we are better at looking away than we are at seeing what God sees, then we're going to be thirsty. If we end up in the wrong place because we sat on our stuff and ignored caring and providing for the needs of those who have even less you don't have to look left and right you only have to look in one direction out to see that there are people who have even less than you do Do you see what God sees? As those present in our sanctuary today prepare to present their offerings here, may you who are present via YouTube and Facebook please consider mailing an offering to help us take care of those who have less our address is 51 West Blackwell Street, Dover, 07801. We would thank you for that partnership in taking care of God's children. Remember, we brought nothing into this world so that we can take nothing out of it. Let us give both the gifts we have been given and our truest selves with glad and generous hearts. And let us unite those hearts as I pray. God who gives life to all things and richly provides us with everything, use these offerings we're about to receive. Take hold of us and show us the life that really is, a life of generosity and caring through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, you could say. Mm -hmm.
One of the missions that we do at our church is for Operation Christmas Child, and what we do is we pack boxes for um, people that are less fortunate than us, and they generally go overseas. So if you do want to donate to this, you can monetarily donate and send it to the church and just write a little slip that this is where you want the money to go. And also we will be um, publicizing the list of the items that we need to put into the boxes. We generally pack between 60 and 100 boxes and uh, each box is filled with a lot of items in it. This week's birthday is Fran D. Giuseppe and the anniversary for Mr. and Mrs. William Gratikos. We wish both of these a um, happy week. We're looking for prayers for Lily, Nushabi, Walt, Wayne, Tony, Pastor Ellen, and Ellen. Prayers of healing and strength for Ellen, who is undergoing radiation treatments and for all cancer patients. Prayers of unity, may we work together for the betterment of all. Prayers for the family and friends in Puerto Rico. May the flood water subside so that they can get supplies and rebuild. Prayers for family and friends in Florida who are preparing for the next hurricane. Prayers for all. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden our hearts and bring peace to our souls today and for all the days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. We believe so, we pray. Lord, this prayer to the people which I'm about to launch in these moments used to be called a pastoral prayer back in the 70s when I was in seminary. And today, as is often the case, that is the kind of prayer I'm feeling as I open my heart to you on behalf of our congregation. Thus, prayers of the people. You see, God, it's because I'm worrying about the questions you or St. Peter might be preparing to ask me when I stand before you someday in the future at the gates of heaven, because I'm afraid I don't have good answers to all of your questions. For instance, motivated by the fact that the denomination which trained me and ordained me and under whose authority I minister in your name encourages Presbyterians to celebrate the gift of immigrants today on this 25th of September, Immigrants who bring gifts which we have been benefiting from since before we declared our independence. Immigrants' gifts which you imparted to them to make this a better church and a better world. Gifts which, when added to the gifts of previous immigrants already present, like those who arrived on the Mayflower or on foot, enhance our potential as a community and the quality of our lives together and our common faith. I'm afraid you're going to ask me, why didn't you, when week after week, I didn't stand up in front of your people and challenge them to speak out to our legislators and differently opinionated family members and neighbors on behalf of refuge-seeking people who come here at great personal physical risk in an effort to protect their children from the bullets of so-called law enforcement or drug gangs or unhealthy drinking water, or insufficient food supplies, substandard health care, or a host of other things they have no choice about or power to protect their families from if they remain in their country of origin. I expect any of us would also immigrate in an attempt to protect our own children's lives if left with no other alternatives. Yet I am afraid to be that prophetic within earshot of them for two reasons. First, I don't want to say anything on which we can't agree that would alienate them from me as their pastor or FMPC as their church. Since all my life, even pre-ordination, I have witnessed good church people vote their disapproval of things the pastor either taught, prayed, or preached things that I had been taught to believe were biblically mandated principles and values. 
by withholding their stewardship, discontinuing their attendance at worship, resigning their membership, or otherwise taking their ball and going home. So I beg your forgiveness, Holy Father, for not being more faithful or courageous in my roles as preacher and prophet. I truly agonize about this. And forgive me for being more afraid of losing members and offerings than proclaiming the whole gospel. And if it's not being self-righteous to ask, please touch the hearts and minds of all your children across our country who still may need to work on thinking biblically about our nation instead of politically, or, if I am wrong, please correct my thinking. In case this prayer has been inappropriate in any fashion, we will conclude this effort of the prayers of the people, as we always do, with the prayer Jesus gave us, which cannot possibly be inappropriate. As we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our parting hymn today is number 367. Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love. You don't know it, but sing it anyway. May the Creator's holiness burn away our complacency. May the living word expose our foolishness. May the spirit of mercy turn us home, that God's grace might spill from our lives, giving hope to a perishing world. Amen.
Come on. Please be seated for a moment of meditation and postlude. Thank you. 